The Science of Justice The science of mine and thine, the science of justice, is the science of all human rights, of all man's rights, of person and property, and of all his rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is a science which alone can tell any man what he can and cannot do, what he can and cannot have, what he can and cannot say, without infringing the rights of any other person. This is the science of peace, and the only science of peace. Since it is the science which alone can tell us on what conditions mankind can live in peace, or ought to live in peace with each other. These conditions are simply these. First, that each man shall do toward every other all that justice requires him to do. As, for example, that he shall pay his debts, that he shall return borrowed or stolen property to its owner, that he shall make reparation for any injury he may have done to another person or property of another. The second condition is that each man shall abstain from doing to another anything which justice forbids him to do, as, for example, that he shall abstain from committing theft, robbery, arson, murder, or any crime against the person or property of another. So long as these conditions are fulfilled, men are at peace, and ought to remain at peace with each other. But when either of these conditions is violated, men are at war, and they must necessarily remain at war until justice is reestablished. Through all time, so far as history informs us, wherever mankind have attempted to live in peace with each other, both the natural instincts and the collective wisdom of the human race have acknowledged and prescribed as an indispensable condition obedience to this one only universal obligation, that each should live honestly toward every other. The ancient maxim makes the sum of a man's legal duty to his fellow men to be simply this, to live honestly and to hurt no one, to give to every one his due. This entire maxim is really expressed in the single words to live honestly, since to live honestly is to hurt no one and to give to everyone his due. Man, no doubt, owes many other moral duties to his fellow men, such as to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, care for the sick, protect the defenseless, and assist the weak, and enlighten the ignorant. But these are simply moral duties, of which each man must be his own judge in each particular case as to whether and how and how far he can or will perform them. But of his legal duty, that is, his duty to live honestly toward his fellow men, this his fellow men not only may judge, but for their own protection must judge, and if need be, may rightfully compel him to perform it. They may do this act singly or in concert. They may do it on the instant as necessity arises, or deliberately and systematically if they prefer to do so, and the exigency will admit of it. Although it is the right of anybody and everybody, of any one man or set of men, no less than another, to repeal justice and compel justice for themselves, and for all who may be wronged, yet to avoid the errors that, may, that are liable to result from haste and passion, and that everybody who desires it may rest secure in the assurance of protection, without resort to force, it is evidently desirable that men should associate, so far as they freely and voluntarily can do so, for maintenance of justice among themselves and for mutual protection against other wrongdoers. It is also in the highest degree desirable that they should agree upon some plan or system of judicial proceedings, which in trial of cases should secure caution, deliberation, through investigation, and, as far as possible, freedom from every influence but the simple desire to do justice. Yet such associations can be rightful and desirable only insofar as they are purely voluntary. 
no man can rightfully be coerced into joining one, nor supporting one against his will. His own interest, his own judgment, and his own conscience must alone determine whether he will join this association or that, or whether he will join any. If he chooses to depend for the protection of his own rights solely upon himself and upon such voluntary assistance as other persons may freely offer him when the necessity for it arises, he has a perfect right to do so. And this course would be a reasonably safe one for him to follow, so long as he himself should manifest the ordinary readiness of mankind, in like cases, to go to the assistance and defense of injured persons and should also himself live honestly, hurt no one, and give to every one his due. For such a man is reasonably sure of always having friends and defenders enough in the case of need, whether he shall have joined an association or not. Certainly no man can be rightfully required to join or support any association whose protection he does not desire, nor can any man be reasonably or rightfully expected to join or support any association whose plans or method of proceedings he does not approve. Uh, as likely to accomplish its professed purpose of maintaining justice and at the same time itself avoid doing injustice. To join or support one that would, in his opinion, be inefficient would be absurd. To join or support one that in his opinion would itself do injustice would be criminal. He must, therefore, be left to the same liberty to join or not to join an association for this purpose as for any other according as his own interest, discretion, and conscience shall dictate. An association for mutual protection against injustice is like an association for mutual protection against fire or shipwreck. And there is no more right or reason in compelling any man to join or support one of these associations against his will, his judgment, or his conscience than there is in compelling him to join or support any other whose benefits, if it may offer any, he does not want or whose purpose or methods he does not approve. No objection could be made to these voluntary associations upon the ground that they would lack the knowledge of justice as a science which would be necessary to enable them to maintain justice and themselves avoid doing injustice. Honesty, justice, natural law is usually a very plain and simple matter, easily understood by common minds. Those who desire to know what it is in any particular case seldom have to go far to find it. It is true it must be learned like any other science, but it's also true that it is very easily learned. Although as illimitable in its applications as the infinite relations and dealings of men with each other, it is nevertheless made up of a few simple elementary principles of the truth and justice of which every ordinary mind has an almost intuitive perception. And almost all men have the same perceptions of what constitutes justice or of what justice requires when they understand alike the facts from which their inferences are to be drawn. Men living in contact with each other and having intercourse together cannot avoid learning natural law to a very great extent, even if they would. The dealing of men with men, their separate possessions and their individual wants and the disposition of every man to demand and insist upon whatever he believes to be his due, and to resent and resist all invasions of what he believes to be his rights, are continually forcing upon their minds the questions, is this act just or is it unjust? Is this thing mine or is it his? And these are questions of natural law. Questions which in regard to the great mass of cases are answered alike by the human mind everywhere. Children learn fundamental principles of natural law at a very early age. Thus they very early understand that one child must not, without just cause, strike or otherwise hurt another. That one child 
must not assume an arbitrary control or domination over the other. And that one child must not, either by force, deceit, or stealth, obtain possession of anything that belongs to the other. That if one child commits any of these wrongs against another, it is not only the right of the injured child to resist and, if need be, punish the wrongdoer and compel him to make reparation, but it is also the right and the moral duty of all other children and all other persons to assist the injured party in defending his rights and redressing his wrongs. These are fundamental principles of natural law which govern the most important transactions of man with man. Yet children learn them earlier than they learn that three and three are six, or that five and five are ten. Their childish plays could not be carried on without constant regard to them, and it is equally impossible for persons of any age to live together in peace on any other conditions. It would be no extravagance to say, in most cases, if not all, mankind at large, young and old, learn this natural law before they have learned the meanings of the words by which we describe it. In truth, it would be impossible to make them understand the real meanings of the words if they did not first understand the nature of the thing itself. To make them understand the meanings of words, uh, justice and injustice, before knowing the nature of the things themselves, would be to make them understand the meanings of the words heat and cold, wet, dry, light and darkness, black and white, one and two, before knowing the nature of the things themselves. Men necessarily must know semantics and ideas no less than material things before they can know the meanings of the words by which we describe them. If justice be not a natural principle, then there is no such thing as injustice, and all of the crimes of which the world has been the scene have been no crimes at all, but simple events like the falling of the rain or the setting of the sun, events of which the victims had no more reason to complain than they had to complain of the running of the streams or the growing of vegetation. If justice be not a natural principle, governments, so-called, have no more right or reason to take cognizance of it, or pretend or profess to take cognizance of it, than they have to take cognizance or pretend or profess to take cognizance of any other non-entity. And all their professions of establishing justice, or of maintaining justice, or of regarding justice, are simply the mere gibberish of fools, or the frauds of impostors. But if justice be a natural principle, then it is necessarily an immutable one, and can no more be changed by any power inferior to that which established it, than can the law of gravitation, the laws of light, the principles of mathematics, or any other natural law or principle whatever. And all the attempts or assumptions on the part of any man or body of men, whether calling themselves governments or by any other name, to set up their own commands, wills, pleasure, or discretion in the place of justice as a rule of conduct for any human being are as much an absurdity, a usurpation, and a tyranny as would be their attempts to set up their own commands, wills, pleasure, or discretion in the place of any and all physical, mental, moral laws of the universe. If there be any such principle as justice, it is of necessity a natural principle, and as such it is a matter of science to be learned and applied like any other science, and to talk of either adding to or taking from it by legislation is just as false, absurd, and ridiculous as it would be to talk of adding to or taking from mathematics, chemistry, or any other science by legislation. If there be in nature such a principle as justice, nothing can be added to or taken from its supreme authority by all the legislation of which the entire human race united are capable. And all the attempts of the human race, or of any portion of it, to add to or take from the supreme authority of justice in any case whatever, is of no more obligation upon any single human being than is the idle wind. 
If there be such principle as justice or natural law, it is the principle or law that tells us what rights were given to every human being at his birth, what rights are therefore inherent in him as a human being, necessarily remain with him during life, and however capable of being trampled on, are incapable of being blotted out, or extinguished, annihilated, or separated, or eliminated from his nature as a human being, or deprived of their inherent authority or obligation. On the other hand, if there be no such principle as justice or natural law, then every human being came into the world utterly destitute of rights, and coming into the world destitute of rights, he must necessarily and forever remain so. For if no one brings any rights with him into the world, clearly no one can ever have any rights of his own or give any to another. And the consequence would be that mankind could never have any rights, and for them to talk of any such things as their rights would be to talk of things that never had, never will have, and never can have existence. If there be such a natural principle as justice, it is necessarily the highest and consequently the only and universal law for all those matters to which it is naturally applicable. And of consequently all human legislation is simply and always an assumption of authority and dominion where no right of authority or dominion exists. It is therefore simply and always an intrusion and absurdity and usurpation and a crime. On the other hand, if there be no such natural principle as justice, there can be no such thing as injustice. If there be no such natural principle as honesty, there can be no such thing as dishonesty. And no possible act of either force or fraud committed by one man against the person or property of another can be said to be unjust or dishonest, or be complained of or prohibited or punished as such. In short, if there be no such principle as justice, there can be no such acts as crimes. And all the professions of government so called that they exist, either in whole or part, for the punishment or prevention of crimes, are professions that they exist for the punishment or prevention of what never existed nor ever can exist. Such professions are therefore confessions that, so far as crimes are concerned, governments have no occasion to exist, that there is nothing for them to do, and that there is nothing they can do. They are confessions that the governments exist for the punishment and prevention of acts that are in their nature simple impossibilities. If there be in nature such a principle as justice, such a principle as honesty, such principles as we describe by the words mine and thine, such principles as men's natural rights of person and property, then we have an immutable and universal law, a law that we can learn as we learn any other science, a law that is paramount to and excludes everything that conflicts with it, a law that tells us what is just and what is unjust, what is honest and what is dishonest, what things are mine and what things are thine, what are my rights of person and property and what are your rights of person and property, and where is the boundary between each and all of my rights of person and property. And this law is the paramount law, and this same law over all the world, at all times, and for all peoples, and will be the same paramount and only law at all times for all peoples, so long as man shall live upon the earth. But if, on the other hand, there be in nature no such principle as justice, no such principle as honesty, no such principle as men's natural rights of person and property, then all such words as justice and injustice, honesty and dishonesty, all such words as mine and thine, all words that signify that one thing is one man's property and that another thing is another man's property, all words that are used to describe men's natural rights of person and property, all such words that are used to describe injuries and crimes, should be struck out of all human languages as having no meanings.
and it should be declared at once and forever that the greatest force and the greatest frauds for the time being are the supreme and only laws for governing the relations of men with each other, and that from henceforth all persons and combinations of persons, those that call themselves governments as well as others, are to be left free to practice upon each other all the force and all the fraud of which they are capable. If there be no such science as justice, there can be no science of government. And all the rapacity and violence by which all ages and nations, a few confederated villains have obtained the mastery over the rest of mankind, reduced them to poverty and slavery, and established what they call governments to keep them in subjugation, and have been as legitimate examples of governments as any the world is ever to see. If there be in nature such a principle as justice, it is necessarily the only political principle there ever was or ever will be. All the other so-called political principles which men are in the habit of inventing are no principles at all. They are the mere conceits of simpletons who imagine that they have discovered something better than truth and justice and universal law, or they are devices and pretenses to which selfish and knavish men resort as means to get fame, power, and money. If there be in nature no such principle as justice, there is no moral standard and never can be any moral standard by which any controversy whatever between two or more human beings can be settled in a matter to be obligatory upon either. And the inevitable doom of the human race must consequently be to be forever at war, forever striving to plunder, enslave, and murder each other, with no instruments but fraud and force to end the conflict. If there be no such obligation as justice, there can certainly be no other moral obligation, truth, mercy, nor any other, resting upon mankind. To deny the obligation of justice is therefore to deny the existence of any moral obligation whatever among men in their relations to each other. If there be no such principle as justice, the world is a mere abyss of moral darkness, with no sun, no light, no rule of duty to guide men in their conduct towards each other. In short, if there be in nature no such principle as justice, man has no moral nature and consequently can have no moral duty whatever.